Welcome to Spoken Injustice, where we put the criminal justice system in the dock. In today's video, we will report on the European Court of Human Rights' much anticipated ruling on the Nealon and Hallam cases and discuss its implications for victims of miscarriages of justice in the UK. We will also analyse the existing UK statutory compensation scheme and explore potential avenues for reform. As always, stay tuned until the end to gather all the information you need to form your own perspective. On the 11th of June 2024, the European Court of Human Rights, sitting as a grand chamber of 17 judges, delivered the long-awaited judgment in the cases of Nealon and Hallam. Both individuals had their convictions overturned but were denied compensation by the Secretary of State under the UK statutory compensation scheme. In two of our previous videos, miscarriage of justice, compensation, adding insult to injury, and Mr. Malkins on compensation and the ECHR, we discussed the cases of Mr. Hallam and Mr. Nillen, the background issues surrounding their cases, and how they came to be before the European Court of Human Rights. You can find both linked in the description below. We recommend watching them for background information before viewing today's video. By way of a quick recap, currently the compensation scheme in the UK is regulated by Section 133 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988. Subsequent acts have repeatedly amended this legislation, imposing increasingly stricter criteria on the overall entitlement to compensation. Notably, the most controversial, the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act 2014, which introduced subsection 1ZA, which provides a definition of miscarriage of justice, which dramatically narrows the compensation eligibility criteria, and which states that there has been a miscarriage of justice in relation to a person convicted of a criminal offence if and only if the new or newly discovered fact shows beyond reasonable doubt that the person did not commit the offence. Nealon and Helen argued first before the Administrative Court, then before the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, that the scheme violates the presumption of innocence enshrined in Article 6, Section 2 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which states that everyone charged with a criminal offence shall be presumed innocent until proven guilty according to to law. Have all these courts rejected their claim? They applied to the European Court of Human Rights under Article 34 of the Convention, which provides redress to individuals claiming to be victims of violation by a contracting state. The first point I would like to note, if I may digress briefly, is that despite the profound implications of this decision, emphasised by the European Court's choice to convene as a Grand Chamber, a step usually reserved for particularly complex or significant cases, major media outlets in the UK have chosen to overlook the news. The Guardian remains the sole consistent news outlet that has covered this story. Mainstream media instead prefer to portray people as guilty before a trial has even taken place, rather than focusing on those who claim a miscarriage of justice. Not surprisingly, driven by this sensational nature of crime stories, which attract higher viewership and readership. Stories of presumed guilt and dramatic accusations often 
overshadow the more complex and less sensational cases of potential wrongful convictions, further complicating the plight of victims of miscarriages of justice. Indeed, the post office scandal serves as a prime example, highlighting the prolonged struggle of those who fought for years before the media finally acknowledged their efforts to bring their plight to the attention of decision makers. I apologize for the deviation, but I couldn't help but mention it. However, its relevance will become more apparent later on in this video, so stay with us until the end. Turning to the actual issues in the case. So what did the Grand Chamber decide? In a very simplified way, the court's judgment delivered by a majority of 12 out of 17 judges clarified as a premise that Article 6, Section 2 offers individuals two levels of protection. The first, which acts as a procedural guarantee, is to be presumed innocent in a criminal trial. And the second, which follows either an acquittal or a reversal of conviction on appeal, is to be protected from being treated by public officials and authorities as though they were, in fact, guilty. In the specific case of the UK Compensation Scheme, the court held that the Secretary of State's requirement that a new or newly discovered fact must show beyond reasonable doubt that the applicant did not commit the offence does not infringe upon either of the two levels of protection offered by Article 6, Section 2. They explained that this requirement specifically pertains only to whether the new or newly discovered fact proves the applicant's innocence beyond reasonable doubt and therefore does not question their overall innocence. In other words, the Secretary of State acknowledges the applicant's procedural innocence as their conviction has been quashed, but does not believe specifically that that new or newly discovered fact establishes their factual innocence. So, overall, the court found by 12 votes to 5 that there has been no violation of Article 6, Section 2. The five dissenting judges, on the other hand, though they also noted uh, the presumption of innocence has two parts to it, they gave a different reading. They assert uh, that Article 6 affords first a legal presumption. You are presumed innocent until proven guilty. This is not an absolute presumption and, as we know, can be overturned if it's proven in a court of law that you have committed the crime. However, they also say that when you are acquitted or your conviction has been overturned, this legal presumption becomes final and it is absolute. It cannot be overturned. And this is the second level of protection, namely that you are considered not to have committed the crime and this can be questioned in any further legal proceedings. The judges asserted that the requirement under section 133 subsection 1 day a day that the new evidence must prove beyond reasonable doubt that you did not commit the crime goes against the presumption of innocence because first it requires re-evaluating your guilt even after your conviction is overturned and secondly, assumes you are guilty unless you can prove your innocence again. They concluded that this requirement shifts the burden of proof back to the applicant, conflicting with the presumption of innocence. Moreover, they say they must do so beyond reasonable doubt, a stringent standard typically applied to the state, not to individuals. We agree with the dissenting judges. However, unfortunately, 
the majority of judges did not share this view. Though it is worth mentioning that the court noted that in at least 21 other contracting parties to the convention, such as Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Italy, Spain, Norway, uh, to mention but a few, there was no proved innocent requirement. This places us among the worst countries in Europe when it comes to recognising the right to compensation to victims of miscarriages of justice. So what does this decision mean for Hallam and Nillen? Sadly, this may mark the end of their legal redress as there is no route for appeal against Grand Chambers' decisions. However, I say may because it is entirely possible that they may have further recourse available through other international bodies, such as, for example, the United Nations Human Rights Committee under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which the UK is a signatory. Though it is important to note that the UN Human Rights Committee has a different jurisdiction and scope compared to the European Court of Human Rights. We are sure that Hallam and Nilan's legal representatives will competently advise them on any future redress they may have in their specific cases. We will discuss the UN Covenant later in the video, so stay with us until the end for a broader perspective. But does this significant decision from the European Court of Human Rights signal the end of hope for victims of miscarriages of justice here in the UK? Well, certainly not. Domestic law can be reformed and a less stringent compensation scheme can be implemented regardless of the court's judgment. And this is indeed where our focus should be, applying the right amount of pressure to achieve such a reform. Indeed, if you recall, last summer, following the high-profile reversal of Mr. Markinson's conviction and the resulting public outrage, Justice Secretary Alex Chalk announced that he was committed to ensuring victims of miscarriages of justice are fairly compensated and that he had urgently commissioned officials at the Ministry of Justice to review the current system to ensure it works in the best interests of victims. However, that led to a mere disappointing reversal of an unfair deduction of saved living costs, which was introduced initially in 2006, a discretion that had not been used by the Secretary of State in any event in over 10 years. We covered this issue in our video, Mr. Markinson Compensation and the ECHR, again linked in the description below, where we urged the Justice Secretary to seriously reconsider the compensation scheme's eligibility criteria rather than focusing on the calculation element. Therefore, we must continue to exercise pressure on those in power to reconsider this scheme and align it with the standards of at least 21 other more generous European countries that do not have a proved innocent requirement. But what are the actual challenges faced by victims of miscarriages of justice here in the UK, whose convictions have been overturned, but who have struggled to secure compensation under the current scheme? And what can be done to assist them? To answer these questions, we must begin with addressing the basics. But before doing so, if you are finding this video useful, do like it and also subscribe to our channel 
to help us in our mission to humanize wrongful convictions. So back to basics. Let's begin by looking at the current compensation scheme in the UK. The guidance can be easily found online. The link is provided below. The guidance states that provided the certain circumstances are met, the Justice Secretary will pay compensation to those who have convictions quashed at out-of-time appeals. So though not listed as a requirement, this is the first limitation. Compensation is afforded only to those whose conviction has been quashed following an out-of-time appeal. As per the specific requirements, these are set out, as we've said, in section 133 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988. And they are, first, that a person must have been convicted by virtue of a final conviction. Second, that a person must have had that final conviction overturned or must have received pardon. Third, that the overturning of the conviction or obtaining the pardon must have been allowed on the basis the new evidence shows beyond reasonable doubt that a miscarriage of justice occurred. Fourth, a miscarriage of justice occurs by definition of section 133 subsection 1ZA when the new or newly discovered fact shows beyond reasonable doubt that the person did not commit the offence. If all these criteria are met, then the Secretary of State must compensate applicants for the punishment suffered. If the person has died, their personal representatives can receive the compensation. However, there is one exclusion. Even if all these criteria are met, the applicant is not eligible for compensation if they are responsible for not disclosing the unknown fact earlier. Then there is a further limitation. Compensation applications must be submitted to the Secretary of State within two years of the conviction being overturned or the pardon being granted. However, the Secretary of State may allow late application in exceptional circumstances. Note though that generally not being aware of the scheme will not count as exceptional circumstance. However, they say each application received out of time will be considered on its specific merit. The Secretary of State decides whether compensation is warranted in each case. If compensation is granted, then an assessor appointed by the Secretary of State will determine the amount. When determining the amount, the assessor must consider certain facts, such as, for example, the seriousness of the offence, the severity of the punishment, the conduct of the investigation and prosecution. And the assessor may reduce the compensation as well. That is based on certain factors, including the applicant's conduct. Finally, compensation is capped at 1 million for cases involving at least 10 years of detention and 500,000 for all other cases. They could have not made it any more difficult. So why providing compensation at all? Well, that is because the UK is apparently committed to granting individuals a range of rights and liberties that are protected both domestically and internationally. In its report to the Joint Committee on Human Rights on the government's response to human rights judgment 2022 to 2023, the Ministry of Justice states the UK has a long-standing tradition of ensuring rights and liberties are protected domestically and of fulfilling our 
international human rights obligations. We have strong human rights protections within a comprehensive and well-established constitutional and legal system. In domestic law, rights are protected through the common law, the HRA, the Human Rights Act, and the devolution statutes, as well as other legislation. The government will continue to protect and respect human rights and liberties, both domestically and through our international obligation. We will maintain our leading role in the promotion and protection of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. The government is also committed to furthering the UK's status as a global outward-looking nation playing an active leading role in the world. As far as its international obligations are concerned, these include those under the European Convention on Human Rights, or ECHR for short, and those under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or ICCPR for short. The ECHR is an international treaty between the states of the Council of Europe. The United Kingdom was one of the states that drafted the ECHR and was one of the first states to ratify it in 1951. The convention came into force in 1953. In addition, the UK implemented the ECHR into domestic law in 1998 with the Human Rights Act. Note though that there have been additional protocols to the ECHR over the years, including Protocol 7, agreed in 1984, which includes the right to compensation. However, the UK has not ratified it as per the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This establishes fundamental human rights that signatory countries must protect and promote. As a signatory country since 1968, and having ratified the treaty on the 20th of May 1976, the UK has committed itself to uphold the rights and obligations enshrined in the covenant, making it part of the country's international legal obligations. The right to compensation for the UK citizens and therefore the obligation for the UK to uphold this right flows directly from Article 14, Section 6, which states that when a person has by a final decision been convicted of a criminal offence and subsequently his conviction has been reversed or he has been pardoned on the ground that a new or newly discovered fact shows conclusively that there has been a miscarriage of justice. The person who has suffered punishment as a result of such conviction shall be compensated according to law. Unless it is proved that the non-disclosure of the unknown fact in time is wholly or partly attributable to him. Does this sound familiar? Well, that's because at a first glance, this provision appears to have been copied verbatim into section 133. Indeed, the guidance that we looked earlier in relation to the UK compensation scheme states that the legislation complies with international obligations, specifically Article 14.6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. However, at a closer look, one can note first that the ICCPR does not state that the newly discovered fact must show that there has been a miscarriage of justice beyond reasonable doubt, but rather uses the term conclusively. The use of the term conclusively rather than beyond reasonable doubt 
is very important, as in our view indicates at least an intention to distinguish the burden of proof from that required in criminal trials, and also, in our view, a decisively lower standard. This view will be in line with the point noted by the dissenting judges in the Nealon and Hallam cases. That is, that the beyond the reasonable doubt standard of proof required in criminal trials is a very high standard of proof, which generally is required by a state, not an individual. Secondly, personally and purely in terms of grammar construction, I interpret the sentence the new or newly discovered fact shows conclusively that there has been a miscarriage of justice to apply only to cases where the person received pardon, not to cases where the conviction has been reversed. This interpretation hinges on the conjunction or. So the way I read it is when subsequently his conviction has been reversed or he has been pardoned on the ground of a new or newly discovered fact which shows conclusively that there has been a miscarriage of justice and the person shall be compensated. Indeed, if the second part was meant to refer to both, then surely there should have been a few commas. This interpretation not only makes sense, as a pardon generally does not overturn a conviction, and therefore this further qualification would have limited its scope but also it appears supported by the fact that the text of Article 3 of Protocol 7 to the European Convention on Human Rights agreed in 1984, though at a first glance seems to use the same wording of the text of Article 14, Section 6, the version is actually slightly different. Can you spot the difference? See those commas? This suggests, in our opinion, that the European Convention takes a more restrictive approach than the ICCPR, requiring both pardon and overturned conviction to be subject to the condition that a new or newly discovered fact conclusively shows that there has been a miscarriage of justice. This stricter approach, however, would not apply to the UK because, as we have mentioned earlier, the UK has not ratified Protocol 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, if you do not agree with this perspective, then this third point should certainly convince you of the non-compliance of Section 133 with Article 14 of the ICCPR. Note that Article 14, Section 6 does not stipulate that the new fact must conclusively prove that the person did not commit an offence, but rather that the new fact must conclusively prove that there has been a miscarriage of justice. In order to establish whether Section 133 is compatible with Article 14, one must define the meaning of miscarriage of justice. The ICCPR does not provide a definition for miscarriage of justice. Therefore, it is important to ascertain the ICCPR's intended interpretation of this concept. The term miscarriage of justice is frequently used to refer to a court error which leads to the conviction of a person for a crime they did not commit. However, this more specifically falls under the category of wrongful convictions which are part of the broader concept of miscarriages of justice. In fact, miscarriage of justice is generally meant to encompass several subcategories, such as, of course, wrongful convictions, when an innocent person is found guilty of a crime they did not commit, procedural errors, 
when mistakes occur in the legal process, such as improper admission or exclusion of evidence, jury misconduct or judicial bias. These also include, in its broader terms, prosecutorial or investigatory misconduct, such as, for example, the case of non-disclosure, whether deliberate or in error. Then there is factual errors highlighted by new evidence. When subsequent discovery of new facts or evidence that, if known at the time of the trial, would likely have resulted in a different verdict. Then there are the legal errors. When errors in the application or interpretation of the law affects the outcome of the case. We believe that the broader term should be favoured because of, and we don't need to look far beyond our domestic arena, a well-recognised and fundamental principle of criminal justice which acknowledges the obvious difficulties in many cases for innocent individuals to show they did not commit the offence. Indeed, on the 22nd of January 2014, whilst the Antisocial Behaviour Bill was discussed in the House of Lords, Baroness Kennedy stated that to ask people to prove their innocence beyond reasonable doubt flies in the face of one of our key legal principles which acknowledges that it is very difficult for people to prove their innocence. She said that in a few cases DNA can prove innocence and in a few an alibi can be bulletproof but those cases are rare. This broader interpretation is also in line with the Supreme Court judgment in the matter of Adams versus the Secretary of State of 2011, in which the Supreme Court, by a majority of five to four, rejected the government's argument that only people who could prove their innocence would be entitled to compensation for miscarriages of justice. Lord Phillips noted that to ask people to prove their innocence beyond reasonable doubt will deprive some defendants who are in fact innocent and who succeed in having their convictions quashed on the grounds of fresh evidence from obtaining compensation. It will exclude of entitlement to compensation also those who no longer seem likely to be guilty but whose innocence is not established beyond reasonable doubt. This is a heavy price to pay, he said, for ensuring the no guilty person is ever the recipient of compensation. He therefore favoured a broader interpretation of miscarriage of justice that included cases in which fresh evidence renders the conviction unsafe in that, had it been available at the time of the trial, a reasonable jury might or might not have convicted the defendant. In light of all of this, we believe the Parliament should repeal the current scheme and enact a scheme that is compatible not only with international obligations, but also in line with our fundamental principles of criminal justice and rule of law. Parliament should focus on our core principles of criminal justice, with due process being a central tenet. Due process ensures the individuals are treated fairly and justly within the legal system, encompassing a set of legal procedures and protections designed to uphold constitutional rights. When due process is violated, the state must take all necessary measures to rectify the situation. Moreover, there is an inherent moral obligation to compensate victims of miscarriages of justice. Miscarriages of justice disrupt lives and cause immense suffering, include loss of reputation, emotional trauma, financial loss and loss 
of liberty. The state has a moral duty to rectify these wrongs and restore individuals to their rightful positions. Providing just, fair and adequate compensation also helps restore public trust in the legal system. It shows that the state is committed to delivering justice and correcting its errors, reinforcing public confidence in the fairness and integrity of the legal system. We demand a scheme that expands the criteria beyond strict requirements such as proving innocence beyond reasonable doubt, and a scheme that considers factors such as the length of wrongful imprisonment, impact on individuals' life, and the state's responsibility in the causation of the miscarriage of justice. A scheme that streamlines and simplifies the application process to make it more accessible and less bureaucratic for applicants. And a scheme that goes even further to consider implementing an automatic compensation. A scheme where compensation is automatically considered or granted upon the overturning of a conviction unless specific grounds for denial are met. A scheme that ensures a fair assessment of evidence presented by applicants, acknowledging the challenges they face in proving innocence after their conviction has been quashed. A scheme that reviews and considers applying changes retrospectively to ensure fairness for individuals who were previously denied compensation under stricter criteria which will include Mr. Hallam and Mr. Nealon. A scheme that establishes an independent review mechanism or panel to assess compensation claims, free from politics and bureaucratic influence. We also urge mainstream media to increase public awareness about the challenges faced by victims of miscarriages of justice to garner public support for reforms to the compensation scheme. Hence the relevance to my rant about media silence delivered earlier in this video. By addressing these fundamental aspects, the scheme can be changed to better support victims of miscarriages of justice and ensure they receive fair compensation for the injustices they have endured. And what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. I want to conclude this session with one final thought. In the dire reality of our broken criminal justice system, no one is immune to the harrowing ordeal of a miscarriage of justice. Therefore, I urge you to join us in striving to uphold a fair criminal justice system where miscarriages of justice are minimised, ensuring that the effective measures are in place to rectify them when they occur. Also, join our networking hub at spokeninjustice.net to help us in our mission to humanize our criminal justice system. Finally, if you find our videos useful, like them and subscribe to our channel to help us in growing our community and our reach. We look forward to usher you as we sit and rise in this unique trial.